the worst actor in history, Romeo Coates. A curious blue carriage in the form of a cockle shell, drawn by two faultlessly groomed and richly decorated horses, caused a furor as it trotted briskly down London's Pall Mall toward the city in the autumn of 1811. Astride it was a huge rooster coated in gold leaf, with outspread wings over an illuminated scroll bearing the motto, While I live, I'll crow. The step of the carriage also was in the form of a rooster. The trappings were ornamented with crowing cocks in silver, while still another cockerel surmounted the bar between the two horses. To cap it off, the buttons of the coachman and manservant bore as their crest the image of a cockerel rampant. The populace was far too astonished at the glory of this equipage to notice the fashionably dressed man, who bowed and doffed his hat with affable impartiality from the comfortably sprung cushions, and it was not until it drew up before the Bank of England that any one had a really good look at him. He was tall, well-built, something of a fop, even in those Regency days. His blue frock coat was handsomely adorned with braid, his cravat was of the latest cut, and he sported a richly coloured bandana handkerchief. But what astonished people was that he dripped with diamonds. Like wildfire, the news flashed around London that Cock-a-Doodle Coates had come to town. Cock-a-Doodle, or Diamond Coates, as he was known, was one of those highly-born, well-bred, wealthy eccentrics who contributed to the glittering pageantry of the Regency days. He was loaded with money and could have been a leading man of fashion, but for his sole driving ambition to be a Shakespearean actor. As such, he had an enormous following, not, alas, because of his brilliance, but because whenever he appeared there was certain to be a riot. For Cockadoodle Coates altered lines to suit himself, lectured the audience from the stage, talked to acquaintances and stage boxes in the middle of an act, and even argued with his fellow actors on the boards. Son of a wealthy West Indian merchant and sugar planter, Robert Coates was born in Antigua in 1772, and, as the only survivor of a brood of nine children, was carefully incubated in one of the best public schools in England. His father quickly cut short his idea of an army career, and he spent his first 35 years as one of the idle rich. Because of the abundance of time on his hands, he joined an amateur thespian society which went on tour in the West Indies. His father promptly put much of his fortune in trust to ensure his son an annual income, lest he should get into the hands of needy and unscrupulous persons connected with the theatre. Assured of a comfortable living, Coates retired to England and settled at the fashionable spa of Bath, where he assiduously cultivated the aristocratic society, fluttered a little at the tables, and ultimately encountered an actor by the name of Pies Gordon. Gordon one day heard him misquoting lines from Romeo and Juliet and corrected him, to which Romeo Coates, as he came to be known, answered, A. That is the reading I know, for I have the play by heart, but I think I have improved upon it. In due course it was announced that on February 9th, 1809, a gentleman of fashion would make his appearance for the first time in England, at Bath Theatre, and so, as the amateur of fashion, spurning all payment, Robert Coates made his debut as Romeo. The stage had never seen an odder Romeo, Dressed in a spangled cloak of sky-blue silk, Coates sported crimson pantaloons and a white hat trimmed with feathers and diamonds. More diamonds flashed from his knee and his shoe buckles. Cheerleaders, whom friend Gordon had planted amidst the audience, gratified the amateur with rounds of carefully rehearsed applause, and all went well until the second act when a section of the audience began to hiss his unorthodox histrionics. The better-bred section hushed them down, but later hissed in their turn, threw apples and orange peel on the stage, laughed when they should have wept and cried, Off! Off! At a ball some nights later, he again appeared in his Romeo costume and enlivened the proceedings by bounding to a supper table to recite amid the glasses and decanters a few selected lines. Romeo Coates immediately became the theatrical rage and a butt for all practical jokers and tricksters, 
When they laughed at his footboard death agonies, he rose to his feet, glared at them, and recited scornful lines of his own composition. Ye bucks of the boxers who roar and reel, too drunk to listen, too proud to feel, whose flinty hearts are proof against despair, whose vast estates are neither here nor there, let high-toned joys and elegance be thine. To pay my tradesmen and be just is mine. No creditor deprived of honest bread mocks my arrogance or shakes his head. A thousand fans were turned away when he made his London debut on 9th of December 1811 at the Haymarket as the gay Lothario. All the great men of the day were there in expectation of an uproar. They were not disappointed. Before the curtain rose, the more boisterous section of the audience booed an emigre French nobleman. But when the bejeweled, gaily dressed Lothario appeared on the stage, the uproar was deafening. Cheers mingled with whistles, catcalls and cries of cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> the incensed coats offered to refund their money to the noisy section if they would leave the theatre. That only provoked more interruptions. Nobody could hear what the actors were saying, and the play was abandoned at the end of the fourth act. He engaged a policeman to keep order at his next performance. As a critic put it, with a dash of irony, no actor since Garrick had attracted such a huge crowd. Even the pit was occupied by the beauty and fashion of London, who were unable to obtain more expensive seats. It would have needed a whole force of police to hold the mob when Coates appeared at the Haymarket on January 11th, 1813. Gate crashes fought their way into the theatre, invaded the reserve seats and fought off the legal holders. They screamed for the hobbies, jeered at Coates when he appeared in scarlet military uniform and punctuated his performance with hoots of long coats, driving coats, flannel coats, petticoats, and turncoats. Following his presentation at court a month later, Practical Joker sent him a portentous missive sealed with the royal arms inviting him to a ball at the Prince Regent's. He duly arrived at Carlton House with his usual ornaments and footmen in splendid livery, only to be told his invitation was a forgery. When the Prince Regent heard that coats had been hoaxed and turned away, he berated the secretary who snubbed him and sent a personal invitation. Even Coates' fellow actors joined in the conspiracy against the amateur of fashion. On his fourth appearance at the Haymarket, the player opposite him mimed his eccentricities by asking, as though it was part of Shakespeare's play, Why drive you in state about the town with curricle and pear? Your crest a cock? During the laughter that followed, Coates wanted to fight his opposite, and then protested to the audience, that a performer had no right to hurt my feelings by inserting allusions to me not in his part. The other actor apologised. Coates consulted friends in a box whether he should accept the apology or not, and then shook hands with his tormentor. The play was then allowed to proceed. At another of Coates' performances as Romeo, someone threw a bantam rooster on the stage during the duel scene. When the young bloods in the audience banged the sides of their boxes with sticks, Romeo roared in anger and shook his sword at the interrupters. Later, when Romeo killed his opponent, a member of the audience threw an orange at the corpse and hit it on the nose. With a cry of pain, the corpse rose and stalked off the stage. The audience then yelled at Romeo, Why don't you die? But he refused and stalked off too. That provided the cue for future audiences who always tried to hit him with oranges in the most harrowing part of the death scenes. Pelted out of London, the ungifted amateur decided to tour the provinces and was roasted in Birmingham. On December the 1st, 1814, he arrived at Stratford-on-Avon, Shakespeare's birthplace, dressed himself in his incredible Romeo costume and marched in procession with other actors from the barn which served as a theatre to the shop where Shakespeare was born. Writing his name on the wall and in the visitor's book, Tragedian Coates called himself an illustrator of the poet, decried the surroundings in which the bard was born, and offered to pull down the shop and build a house in its place which would look more fitting as the bard's birthplace. On Shakespeare's monument he wrote, 
His name in ambient air still floats and is adored by Robert Coates. Having thus made his pilgrimage, the amateur returned to London with renewed hope, but was so severely heckled that he decided to give up the game and to continue more freely in purse than in person, to histrionics. It nearly broke his heart when his fine cockle-shell curricle fell to pieces, but he soon startled London with another. His second carriage was of copper, shaped like a kettle drum on two large serpents with lashings of rooster emblems, and his old motto, While I live, I'll crow. He drove about London with two liveried servants who had their orders to keep a respectful distance. A late marriage, high living, and an economic depression in the West Indies all combined to wreck his fortune, and in 1830 forced him to flee from his creditors to Bologna, where he spent ten years at the Hotel de Nor, the only hotel where persons of very high rank can be fitly accommodated. Compounding with his creditors, the now forgotten cockadoodle coats returned to the scene of his triumphs. In 1840, wearing well-creased Hessian boots that were three decades out of date, still an ardent theatre-goer, he was fatally crushed between two carriages on February 15, 1848, after attending the grand annual concert at Drury Lane Theatre. He died six days later at the age of 75.